Good afternoon, everyone. You're all very welcome to this month's AWARE webinar on the lived experience of bipolar disorder. My name is Dr. Susan Brannock. I'm delighted to introduce myself as the new clinical director with AWARE, and I'll be hosting our conversation today. So we're just going to take a few moments now to let people join in, and we'll get going shortly. No. So to those just joining, you're all very welcome again to our webinar today on the lived experience of bipolar disorder entitled Bipolar and Me. So thanks to those continuing to join and a warm welcome to our guest panelists today, Steve Kinch and Sophie White, who I will introduce in just a few moments. So as I said, my name is Dr. Susan Brannock. I'm a clinical psychologist and the new clinical <coughs> director with AWARE. So really delighted to host my first webinar today and look forward to getting involved in this monthly webinar series going forward where we talk about all things mental health related. So just before we get started, I'd like to take a minute to tell you about AWARE and maybe just give you a bit of an overview about the time together this afternoon. So for those of you who aren't familiar with AWARE, we provide free support and well-being services for anyone affected by depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, and for those uh, supporting loved ones in that. So please do check out our website for more information on the programs uh, and education that we have. So that's aware.ie. So our webinar today is part of a wider program of events that AWARE is running to support in World Bipolar Day, and that's coming up on the 30th of March. So the intention of World Bipolar Day is really to increase awareness and understanding of bipolar disorder. So as I said, keep a lookout on our website for information related to that. In terms of our webinar this afternoon, just to let you know that we will be recording the webinar, and that recording should be available on our YouTube channel um, probably later on this afternoon. Okay. So I'm really mindful of the subject matter today and the potential for any distressing or, or triggering topics to come up. So really encouraging you to know that if you need to leave the webinar at any time, uh, that's fine. You can always return to it again on the recording if you want at a later, a later date. Um, and certainly if you find any of the content distressing today, really encouraging you to link back in with your self-care practices and reaching out for support if you, if you feel you need it. So kind of GP, family, friends, your own mental health services. So, so really minding yourself in that today. Okay. We really welcome questions and reflections during the webinar. So please do use the Q&A box to, to put them to us. I'll uh, put them to our guest speakers today and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. Uh, we probably won't get to all of them. So apologies if we, do, if we don't get to your question. Um, we will see where we get to with that. And as I said, do check out our website for more information if there's questions that, that are, you're left with. Okay, so now moving on to our panel. I'm really delighted to introduce Steve and Sophie today. He'll share their stories and, and give a bit more of an insight into the reality of what it's like to live with bipolar. Um, I'll introduce them to, I'll invite them to introduce themselves in just a minute, but just at this point, even before we start, to really say a heartfelt thank you to both of them, to, both for giving up their time this afternoon and, and for sharing their stories. So, so thank you very much. So maybe if I just go to you, Sophie, and if I start with you, maybe if I can ask you just to really briefly introduce yourself and say a little bit about what brought you to volunteer for this webinar today, and then I'll come to you, Steve. I'm sure. Hi, thank you so much, Susan, and thanks to everyone who's joining us. Um, so my name is Sophie, um, I'm uh, 37, um, I have three kids, um, I am a writer, and um, obviously I have bipolar, and um, I suppose probably what brought me here today was, I think, some of the pieces of writing I have done around uh, being bipolar, um, 
in both uh, my books and in the Sunday Independent, where I write a column every week uh, called Nobody Tells You. And I have uh, written uh, columns such as Nobody Tells You What It's Like to Be in a Psychiatric Hospital and Nobody Tells You uh, What Mania Feels Like. Um, so it's a column that is every Sunday and certainly some weekends it's about Nobody Tells You how evil toddlers are and then other weeks it's it's subjects like this that I, I get I guess I'm really lucky uh, to have that platform to be able to explore that and I also have the support of my great editors in the Sunday Independent who who want to share those experiences um, and so I'm really happy to be asked here today and to chat um, and I'm really excited to meet Stephen because I think for bipolar people we get quite excited meeting other bipolar people because it doesn't feel like there's a whole load of us around the place, you know, and yeah. there probably totally is, but I guess we're not saying it, you know, and um, so great to meet you both. Thanks for having Brilliant. me. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. And Steve, if I could come to you just to introduce yourself briefly and, and just say, yeah, what, what kind of led you to volunteer to, to chat with us today? Um, I'm 63. Steve, sorry to, um, to cut across. Bit, Can you, Steve? Sorry, I, your uh, sound uh, is a little uh, bit hard to hear. Oh, you um, it. And what I found there is an article today is I do. Yeah. Steve, do you want to try with your camera now. off? It's a little bit broken up. Do you want to try with the camera? Yes. Sorry yeah. about that. Yeah. Yeah. That's no problem. Sorry, Steve. We yeah, missed, my... We missed the bit where you were saying. Would you mind? Would you mind saying that again? Yeah, what I was saying is the reason I ended up uh, here today uh, is I attend the support group on a Wednesday night and mm. I've met a lot of people and I've realised how different bipolar is for different people and, yeah. and I thought it'd be a good idea to come on here and to just describe how my journey has been with bipolar Yeah, and my um, father before that. Uh, so I've lived with bipolar all my life, mm -hmm. and I've been subject as well, actually. Um, so that's that's the main reason. Um, I live with my family in Clare. Um, we have a full house at the moment. I've got two boys, 27 and 29, that have both moved home. Mm. So I don't get a lot of time. But it is lovely to have them around. And it's so nice to live in a nice part of Ireland. Mm. And um, it definitely helped me stay well. Okay. Thank you, Steve. And, and Steve, I'm sorry about the, the connection. So sometimes it might be tricky to hear you. So if it's okay with you, I might ask you to repeat at various points. Um, Absolutely but... no problem. We're having technical de technical yeah, problems. Yeah, happens to um, all of us. <laughs> Yeah, and so nobody wants so, to look at me anyway. So. Ah, well, I'm sorry not to see your face though. So maybe, <laughs> maybe when you're talking, um, maybe the camera off might be good. Yeah. But certainly good though to, to see you on screen though when you're not talking because we don't want to lose you either. You know, not a problem. Um, yeah. 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 Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, and apologies all joining us. Um, technical difficulties. We'll do our best to, to navigate through. But, but brilliant. But thank you, Steve. It sounds like yeah, as you were saying, kind of living. Kind of in Clare and, and kind of older kids kind of coming back and, and there's a lot maybe in, in that and sort of staying well yeah 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 so so maybe um I guess I was thinking about sort of starting off the conversation and maybe one of the things that comes up a fair bit is is diagnosis in bipolar oftentimes people can have a long journey to that and I wondered maybe maybe again if I start with you Sophie about if I could ask you just a bit about your experiences of getting that diagnosis whether it was a kind of a long route to that a fast route and, and I suppose what it was like to receive it. Sure. Um, so I think it was probably a relatively circuitous route um, to getting my diagnosis. So I was diagnosed in the end uh, at 34. Um, but I'd had my first um, like breakdown uh, when I was 22. And I think uh, that first breakdown was uh, kind of, I'd been sort of told at the time that it was kind of drug-induced, um, drug-induced psychosis. I had some auditory hallucinations. I had some kind of sensory disturbances along with 
like acute uh god fear and anguish and uh that kind of where you know went on for months uh led into um feeling suicidal um and that was all quite um i suppose rapid in some ways like uh i literally was at a festival and i took a pill and it was like a switch flipped and my life has never been the same again mm -hmm. um now with many years having passed since i kind of can see that there was definitely more to that whole episode and sure. um, then simply um you know taking that pill even though you know that absolutely was a huge part of the catalyst and um, mm -hmm. and then so that was 2007 so between 2007 and 2020 I had different episodes that were quite I suppose I'd, I'd classify them um, as bad in terms of they eventually led to suicidal feelings so that's kind of my hierarchy of mm -hmm. um episodes is like what put me into such a bad space um, and they were all kind of a bit different but I suppose they when I got my diagnosis at 34 it was after being hospitalized um, in 2020 and it just brought sort of clarity to mm. the kind of previous 12 years I sort of it suddenly started to realize that it was a pattern of mm. up and then like abrupt downs up and downs you know um and it kind of helped me make sense of myself and yes. and what i had always thought i always thought yeah like that i had never been able to outrun the original breakdown mm -hmm. that was really what always seemed to when i'd get into a bad episode all the old feelings of breakdown would come back and I could often find my mind sliding into kind of slightly delusional side of things. I think one of my most memorable ones was in 2018 around Halloween. Mm -hmm. I got, I'd become, I'd gotten this conviction that I was possessed or I started to worry that I was possessed and that this was what had always been wrong with me. Not that I was mentally ill, but that I was possessed. And when I'm in my right way, I'm like, no, that's not what this is. Mm -hmm. You're not possessed. People don't get possessed, you know, but it's it's the way that your whole perspective becomes so compromised when you're yeah. ill. Like, it's just astounding what it can do to your brain, you know, and I remember on on that particular episode, like I was really frightened, like I was really scared of what was happening in in my brain and I was um I mean I was looking after two young kids and uh my husband was away for work and I just remember being like like this has to like I need help and I went to a GP mm -hmm. to get a referral because at the time I wasn't being seen in John of Gods and um I just remember having to sit down opposite this like totally like nice guy GP and be like so I think I might be possessed but I also think that might be a bad sign that I think that mm -hmm. and he just looked really like uh, <laughs> this is not a cold or flu but yeah. he he was great because of mm -hmm. course he was you know um but it was just quite I guess I thought it was kind of funny in a way mm -hmm. I was like there's some kind of bleak humor here this guy yeah. just thought he was coming to work in the nice GP practice and then I appeared in front of him and was like, I need a referral. Mm. Um, I had been seen in John of Gods um, when I was 22 for that yeah. first breakdown. Okay. And yeah. um, I'd kind of uh, been connected in with them for many years, but I'd, mm. yeah, I'd kind of, uh, yeah, I'd drifted, I suppose, shall we say. And uh, mm. so, yeah, those are the kind of things that I can experience when yeah. um, my mind slides, you know, sure. um, so it's kind of, I guess, I can be really up and mm. really like full of energy and like feel I'm feeling so great mm. and I'm fe then I'm feeling the best I've ever felt. And then people around me are starting to suggest that I need to kind of calm down and stop taking so much on. And I, I'm like, no, what are you talking about? I don't, you're being ridiculous. This mm. isn't the mental illness. This isn't mania. This mm. is, I feel absolutely amazing. And um, it's like being on a horse 
that galloping and you know yeah. if, if you ever, I've, I've only been on a horse like once but I remember this feeling of like it going really fast and suddenly mm. so fast that it felt like it was flying yeah, it was yeah. amazing feeling mm. and then now that's how I always kind of liken mania to that feeling of mm. flying but then like you're suddenly not holding the reins anymore mm. and, yeah. and for me that always it goes into you know I, I start to not be able to sleep at night I'm mm. suddenly up at all hours mm -hmm. my brain is winding through strange thoughts yeah. you know um and I'm making often a big one for me is starting fights with people is being recorded and and starting to my perception definitely of, yeah. of what's going on starts to get really really compromised yeah and, and I, then yeah. I crash okay yeah that's a really it's a really well kind of like description sorry there's a bit of a an echo there um but as you say so the kind of the diagnosis maybe maybe offering a, a helpful way to see the patterns over a while isn't it and, and it sounds like you have such a clear awareness of this is sort of the the building up the the mania phase and then the crash and i guess yeah. all that goes with that yeah 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 I've been really lucky i think yeah. that I because I've now been with the same psychiatrist and psychologist mm. for like three years that I have such a shorthand with them and they've been mm. able to really help me and they really monitor me yeah. and you know I think that that sort of stability in my care mm. is amazing yeah it's really crucial isn't it yeah yeah and and Steve I, I guess I'm really wondering about kind of whether any of that sort of echoed with you or something similar or different certainly around your experience of, of receiving the diagnosis of bipolar what that was like kind of how it landed with you oh Steve we can't hear you now um you might be on mute Okay, so I don't know if you can, uh, yeah, we still can't hear you, but it seems like you're coming in on a separate. Sorry, Stephen, sorry, everyone. I guess this is the perils of Zoom, isn't it? Where they work, and sometimes it, it doesn't yeah. work. Ah, okay. Do you want to, can you hear us, Steve? Steve, can you hear us there? I hear you now. Yeah, sorry about that. Ah, brilliant. Glad to have you back. I can hear you. Yeah, come, welcome back. Steve, sorry. I was just, no worries at all. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Huh? Uh, it's, I'm not sure if you if you heard me there, Steve, but I was asking you about your experience of, of receiving the diagnosis of bipolar. If you could tell us a bit about that, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I mentioned earlier, my father uh, was bipolar. Um, and myself and my four sisters grew up in a house. Uh, Sorry, Steve, the, the sound is very, a bit tricky uh, to hear. And... Oh, so... We're having it, aren't we? Sorry, Steve. Maybe, yeah, if we try again? Sure, follow. Yeah, my, my father was bipolar. Yeah. And... I went to university and went my last second to last year and I got what I would consider was the exam pressure, mm. which is quite often a trigger. Yeah. And I got very depressed at college and came home for the summer and wasn't in very good form at all. Um, didn't really know what was happening to me. Mm. Didn't be able to discuss it with my mum or my sisters. And then I, at the end of that summer, I ended up going into my first tie. Okay. <clears throat> uh, age 22. And it was a very bad high. Mm. Um, I went to college for my last year, uh, high as a kite, um, interrupting proceedings, just not sleeping, 
shaved all my hair off, and wearing army fatigues, very, very strange behaviour. And I had to leave uh, our medical grounds back in a year's time. So I went back home and inevitably you come down after a high. And I realised that I'd fallen out of um, a very good life down into you know, the depths when you're leaving college. Mm. I ended up in hospital in the same ward uh, to my dad, but not at the same time. Yeah. Um, with a psychiatrist. And that psychiatrist diagnosed me at the age of 22. Mm. with bipolar so any diagnosis um, and really that was 42 years ago mm. and um, it's been you know it's been a journey since uh, um, yeah. but it's never been a journey Susan it's it's taken that again? different avenues and different paths yeah, yeah. It's taken a very, very different uh, format of mm. bipolar. Mm. It's different. So that's my mm. first signs of it yeah. and diagnosis. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you. It, and it, as you said, so it's 42 years ago. Is that what you said? That, that you yeah. had that? Yeah, yeah gosh, it's, it would have been a very different world back then as well, wouldn't it? And as you said. Well, it was manic. It was manic depression yeah. then. Depression, yeah. Not a nice term. Yeah. And uh, it was uh, the psychiatric unit was mm. old Victorian sanatorium. Mm. Very uh, bit like the old one in Ennis. Okay, I'm not I'm not familiar, but I can imagine. I guess a bit of a sense of what it might have been like. Maybe probably very different to to kind of services and care today, probably. Yeah. 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 And you were it saying was, that. Um, yeah, it's just that you go in there and you think, am I going to get out? Yeah. That's, you know, if you're depressed. Um, whereas my dad had to go into hospital mm. with a uh, uh, mania. So it was, yeah. it was all very strange, you know, very, very, very difficult to take on board at that age. I can imagine, yeah, yeah. And as you said, with your the experiences of your dad and being in the same the same place as you said, not the same time, but feels yeah, quite yeah. a lot in that, yeah. And I and I guess maybe yeah. Sophie, you had kind of said a little bit too about that sort of experience of what no one tells you about kind of the psychiatric admission. It sounds I don't know if you had anything similar or different in, in that sort of idea. Will I ever get out of here, or or how it is to be in it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I it's very difficult. Yeah. Go on, Sophie. Yeah. Um, I mm. think with um with my first breakdown uh when I was seen in Johnny God's when I was 22, um it was it's nothing like Steve's experience now in terms of you know how difficult it must have been like several decades ago, but even like um you know nearly 20 years ago the whole attitude around um, mental illness in this country was, it was really different. Like, I mean, it genuinely wasn't spoken about, like I'd say people nowadays probably can't really believe that so recently as 2007, it was like really not spoken about. And, mm -hmm. um, and like, I, like I was told to never tell anyone that I was being seen in John of God's and I remember uh, paying uh, cash like for my treatment so that it wouldn't be like, I just remember somebody being like, don't claim it on your insurance. Mm -hmm. You don't want that on paper anywhere. And obviously that's a very stigmatizing thing to hear mm -hmm. um, when you're 22. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you kind of, you, you metabolize all of those messages, you know, don't tell anyone that what's happening to you, because they'll write you off and um you know the actual <laughs> care was amazing that side of it you know I, I can't I'm lucky 
Steve, that I don't relate on that level because the care was so um, like holistic before that was even a buzzword that we'd be saying, you know, they were talking about self-care and, and measures to stay well when you're well um, and, you know, things like that. Um, but it was just generally the kind of message I heard was like, don't tell people about this. Mm -hmm. um, and that was in 2007. And like even kind of uh, in the years since when I've been doing my work and writing around mental illness, you know, I've definitely heard so much from people about the kind of the burden of their silence and the, mm -hmm. how they've had to bear their illness silently and like never open up fully to the people in their lives and like just what a terrible kind of attend it's sort of like a symptom that would compound on your illness is mm -hmm. to keep it you know so buried and um, that it'll almost calcify inside us you know if we never mm -hmm. tell them it's, my heart breaks when I think about older generations with these illnesses and just like how profoundly isolating it must have been and um when I wrote about, say, being a, in a psychiatric hospital, what I really wanted to convey was that it's it's normal, mm. that it's a normal place and yeah. it's full of quote unquote normal people mm -hmm. if there is such a thing. And that like, you know, it's it's about being given this. It, it's an incredible gift of respite yeah. from, you know, the stress and struggle of managing your illness and managing your life. And I, that's how I found it to be. I, I mean, I went in because I was, um, you know, I was afraid for myself and people were afraid for me that I was going to hurt myself. But, you know, I, what I got there was just an incredible uh, space to just recalibrate, to, to build up the resilience again. Like, I think that's the thing when you, especially when you, you know, you burn yourself out on a high. And then like, for me, my my lows are so abrupt and my mm. highs are abrupt as well like I seem to have mm. very abrupt cycles yeah and I don't know if anyone else here on the on the webinar relates like you know if they have it the same kind of way where, where like I could be sort of like absolutely buzzing on a Tuesday morning full of like all of the ambition and excitement I have mm. and then I, I, I could literally be having suicidal thoughts by that yeah. afternoon like it's just slams me up slams me down and um so like just to feel like that I was safe like yeah. feel that I was being kept safe from myself mm -hmm. that is such a huge gift of uh, you know uh, being in hospital or being taken care of in the psychiatric yeah. services and so I really just wanted to write a piece about mm -hmm. how you know there's no you know I mean yes there is of course locked wards and I was on a locked ward for you know well I was under lock I suppose there I was on a ward where some patients yeah. were allowed access to leave and some weren't and you usually graduated to being allowed to go downstairs to the coffee shop or whatever mm -hmm. um but basically just to normalize it and be like do you yeah. know what like you're in there it's the same as another any other hospital you're mm -hmm. having fights over the biscuits at the tea mm -hmm. station you know what I mean yeah, and you're being very, really well cared for I, but you're making mm. friends as well like you're meeting people who totally understand you mm. so anyway that was a big thing for me trying yeah. to I don't mean to ramble on but trying yeah, to write you know, about the normality of it and yeah. you know and to make think, it like, yeah. like anyone would go to hospital yeah. and you'd say how are you yeah and exactly you come out but there is a, a thing mm. where you come out of a mental hospital people don't talk to you about it really yeah. So, yeah and I understand it's... why I do understand yeah. why but I do want to I want to contribute to yeah. changing that you know yeah and so absolutely if your friend comes out of psychiatric hospital send them flowers mm. you know don't just be scared to mention it because sure. you have to yeah. normalize it yeah absolutely and as you say certainly if you broke your leg or if you had a physical health condition we wouldn't we wouldn't kind no. of be reluctant to go to hospital so it is important isn't it to say it's it's one part of care and as you said it can be a really helpful respite um so that's really just one thing go on steve just yeah just one thing comparing you know treatment these days compared to the 1980s um yeah you know I had DCT when I was 22. Mm. There were no talking therapy available. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's the one thing that um, things have moved on. Mm. Things have moved on. 
responses. And I think, you know, if people do get access to any talking therapies, mm. I think they should be, definitely. Yeah, 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 that's really important, isn't it? The talking therapies are, are as much a part as medication for people, and it's important to get access to everything that's going to yeah. help. Yeah. And, yeah, and I guess maybe a question's come in, actually, maybe it's relevant at this point, just in terms of of kind of recognizing sort of signs, maybe maybe I suppose we call them like maybe early warning signs or kind of relapse trigger. So maybe whether early warning signs for a high or a low. And Steve, maybe I can start with you. I might I might interrupt you if the sound is a bit bad there. So apologies, yeah. but, but see how we okay. go with the sound. Yeah. Did you get the question there? I did, yeah. yeah. Um I, I my bipolar in the last six years is rapid cycling. Mm. Um, which basically was mentioning, you know, how she can change her mood within days. Yeah. Um, mine is weak. Mine is, um, there, I have no manic episodes anymore. Okay. So I don't have any, trust, um, any um, foreknowledge that it's coming. I don't get them anymore. Um, mm. I get very, very good well periods. Mm. Uh, um, at the moment, I could be ill for four or five weeks, depressed, mm. and be well for 12 weeks. Mm. Um, and the depression is very, very deep. Um, but, you see, the rapid cycling, mm. I actually go down in about two days, over, okay. over the course of two days. Mm -hmm. There's no long, there's no long build-up. Yeah. Uh, and I come out of it. You come out of it. Yeah, uh, one or two days. Okay, so you go um, in in a couple of days and come out. In yeah, I can yeah. come out of it. Yeah, yeah. So it's quite different yeah. from a lot of people. Mm. Um, and uh, you just have to learn to live with it. But it hasn't always been like that. Okay. It's panned out in the last five or six years. Mm. Um, very hard to live your life and plan anything. Mm. It's planning a holiday in three months' time mm -hmm. because I don't know. If I know. Um, all I do is try and stay well. Yeah. And I have a number. Of, I know we're going to talk about later. Uh, yeah. Um, and I have a number of, um, you know, people uh, mm -hmm. and things that I try. To stay well yeah 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 thank yeah. you yeah it's, it sounds it sounds very unpredictable as you say so it's hard to yeah, plan I'm just about to say and that. It's, yeah and it's hard to, yeah yeah it's weird yeah and and who's uh, usually frustrating susan i'd imagine yeah yeah and and it might be that you we know. come to this in a, in a bit but uh, yeah i wonder what it's like then for you i guess it, it sort of sounds like it sort of rolls in out of nowhere and rolls out out of nowhere and that that feels yeah. quite as you said frustrating yeah yeah and you know when i am when i am depressed mm. i give up everything that keeps me well all my regime mm. of trying to stay well depression just completely flattens it um yeah. and uh but anyway gotta get on with it yeah 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 thank you and and, and it sounds like you have you've been okay. living well for, for for quite a long time and and sophie maybe if i go back to you on that in terms of those sort of signs or indicators maybe of a high or a low um, what sort of how and not necessarily that you have to say what they are but kind of you're even how you how you've kind of determined what they are you know um no I definitely I mean I don't mind saying what they are um and I've definitely become better and better at identifying and also I my family have become so good I have mm -hmm. a, I have a one close friend and then my husband and my mother who they're like my spotters mm -hmm. And I have to really force myself to trust them when they're saying something that I don't like to hear, don't want to hear that they think I'm getting manic. Mm -hmm. I pract it practically makes me more manic <laughs> to hear it. Mm -hmm. But um, I've, I've tried to train myself to trust them and like they can 
literally right down to just my my demeanor like my talking can mm. become very you know frenetic I have the a very specific sensations in my body when I'm starting to get a bit up I can just feel this kind of fizzing yeah. inside uh, that is just kind of relentless there's a relentlessness about how I'm going through my days um, mm. and as I said it can start to feel um, out of my hands almost it can just get mm. too too much and I've like I can get really locked on an idea as well and I think that's one of the things that like my husband uses to try and get through to me a bit like he'll be like okay you're very fixated on this one idea I'm thinking of one example from a recent kind of episode was I wanted to repaint um the kitchen and living room and uh you know he was like you have so much other stuff on I don't know why you're getting so fixated on this and I was like, I just would not rest until I was doing it. And mm. then I did the whole thing in the space of a day. Like that is a lot of painting for one person mm. in the space of a day, two coats. And like I was, but I just needed to burn off some of the, the manic kind of energy. And mm. like, that's one of the most benign examples I can yeah. come up with yeah. is, is repainting. Like, you know, obviously it, <laughs> they're not always that benign. Sure. Yeah, but I feel a very, there's really specific physical sensations. I can't eat. I kind of, mm. all of those kind of things that are really important to keeping stability, like yeah. eating regularly, I, that goes out the window for me. I just can't do it. And yeah. I don't want to. And you can kind of get weirdly addicted to the highness. Mm. And that's a kind of, it starts to really feed on itself. It's like yeah. a snake eating its own tail, you know, that kind of way. Yeah. And like, then when um like when the whole wheels come off like with the um the depression and I'm really lucky that touch wood really the lows have never like lasted mm. longer than like weeks maybe like mm. maybe at, at, at worst maybe like a couple of months but like but they're very extreme they're kind of yeah cute but luckily not too long and I find with that like you know I feel like my psychiatrist can simply tell by how I'm sitting in the chair you really? know yeah like it's just I think anyone who experiences it you are like another person like and you can't access yeah. who you usually are it's just like there is you know just a a screen between you and your old self and between you mm. and life and it's just, um, yeah, it's just so, I, I don't know, the the emptiness of it is so mm. frightening. It's just like yeah. kind of yawning a bit. And I have a real, like, I don't, I go into a, I don't care about anything space. Like mm. I really, mm. you know, that kind of comes on very quickly. And, and yeah, then like, I thoughts of 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 self harming and things like that mm, mm. very quickly. And like I said, it's so like Steve was saying about how unpredictable it is. Like mm, mm. I find it's very unpredictable. I mean, yes, I think the mania always seems to come on with work stuff, particularly. Okay. Like I have yeah. to really, really be careful around that stuff. Mm. But like the, I don't know. Like I, I find it really baffling even to explain mm. it to myself how yeah. I can go so low so fast sure like how can one person be like repainting the whole living room uh, one day and the next day wondering like how much thinking about suicide is too much thinking about suicide mm, mm, mm. you know I'm sorry to put it in such bold terms and yeah. I hope that that's not harmful for anyone listening and um, I really only mean to share my experience and sure. yeah. you know and it's a hard yeah. one to talk about, but I think it's what, it's what we're here for, really, isn't it? Yeah, so. absolutely. And certainly, I guess then that's something something maybe people are often concerned about, maybe relatives or, or kind of other people. If I, if I ask about suicide, if I mention it, it might bring it to the person's mind. And actually, it, it does the opposite. It allows a bit of more of a, a conversation, doesn't it, to say, well, actually, sometimes things do get that bad. And this is what helps and this is what doesn't help and, and kind of how, how we can navigate back out of that. So, but mm. yeah, so... and. I guess it's it's it sounds like it's it can be part of it for 
for people. Yeah. And as you said, kind of the, the mania feels like it's quite, there, there, there's more kind of clearer links. So maybe there's kind of some routine stuff like work and stuff that are being mindful of. But sometimes it's, yeah, it's that kind of difference that maybe feels a bit disconcerting, really, or hard to, as you said, hard to even to explain it to yourself. It's a bit hard to make sense of of this, the shift. Yeah. And it might be that people yeah. listening have a very similar sort yeah. of experience to that or, or different, you know, but it's. Yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's very the whole kind of texture of life feels different and yeah. very yeah. flat and uh, like like you're just observing yourself mm. and your life at a remove. Okay, so disconnected yeah. maybe. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, but, and and I don't know, Steve, if that's if that's any kind of similar or different to your experiences. Um. Yeah, we're all different, aren't we? Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah I, I really, I don't know what to say, really. To be honest, it's it's a difficult one. Mm. Um, but uh, I'm not usually sure. I can't talk about this. Um, say that again. I didn't catch it. Sorry, Steve. Move on. Move on. Sure. I'm not usually sure of words uh, to okay. say. Yeah, well, I think you're doing really well with the, the tech issues as well. So I'm very grateful for you to, to hang in there. So, so thanks yeah. for staying with us. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess maybe something that did come up there was, was as you were saying, sort of Sophie, kind of you, people who might be able to help. So husband or, or friend. And I don't know, kind of maybe for you, Steve or, or Sophie, kind of what's helpful from people? What's good in the support? Yeah, yeah. You want to start, I, Steve? I've got, uh, yeah, I've got four sisters. Yeah. Um, family whatsapp mm. and uh, we're posting most days mm. and we're supporting each other and good stuff lots of good stuff happy mm. and it's I think, um, i'm a great fan of whatsapp and yeah groups. big fan of whatsapp yeah. Uh, yeah and then they they ring me i ring them mm. uh, um it's here in ireland um yeah. My my wife's amazing. Really, she's still putting up with me after thirty two years. Um, it's a long time. Of lots of lows. It's a long time. Yeah, it is. And then I have my two lads. Um, yeah. and you know when dad's not well, but they do their best. And when dad's well, he does his best. Yeah. Um, yeah. and that's his. I have three. Uh, really, really solid, good friends mm. um, lovely, who I'm, I'm there for them and they're there for me. Mm. Uh, we go walking, we play golf, we go walking, you know, we go and watch rugby. Mm. So I have all that from friends and family. And also I'm there for them. I think that's yeah. the important yeah. thing. Uh, same as the aware... Um, you know, bipolar groups in the mm. evening. It's about you saying things. It's about you supporting other people as well. Yeah, yeah. And friendships, um, my friendship are both definitely both both ways. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm. My advice would be that if you have family and and you uh, have good friends and you mm. worry that your manic episode in particular has made your relationship put it under strain when you're well do try and mend those bridges mm. because good, really really good friends are few and far between I don't know, from my experience uh, and um, I do feel very, very lucky to have real quality family and friends there mm. for me yeah, yeah thank you yeah it sounds like that's yeah. really supportive even the the daily kind of whatsapp but also as you say yeah. steve i think that's really important what you're saying that it's a two-way relationship as well so there might be times when yeah. someone supports you but you also support other people so it's and that's not going to be impacted and and you were yeah. mentioning that that idea of maybe kind of after maybe kind of more extreme periods kind of coming back to those friendships you said sort of yeah sort of repairing maybe or, or but I guess there's yeah 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 
I I cut myself off when I'm depressed. I, yeah. I cut myself off friends and family. Uh, yeah. Uh, but they keep going. They keep they keep calling me. They keep mm. texting me. They keep WhatsApping me. And then when I get better after a few weeks, mm. I do exactly kind of mend. I don't think I have to mend any relationships, mm. but I do feel I have to start them up again. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just and a little I, kickstart. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess that's 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 really true of depression, isn't it? It's quite isolating. It disconnects yeah. people from other people, and it, I guess yeah. there's a lot of stuff that's generated in our minds about kind of self worth or value, and and people kind of not wanting to see mm. us like this, and and. I, and I guess it's interesting to have those conversations with people after. Actually, they'd be very happy to to see you as as you are a yeah. lot of the time. As you say, good friends are, are hard to hard to come by. Yeah, but there's something about kind of not always buying in or believing some of those depressed thoughts or or those kind of thoughts from more extreme places, which is really tricky, yeah. isn't it? In the moment, it's it's very easier tricky. when things are a bit more stable. Um, and I don't know yeah. if that's yeah, Sophie. Back to you. In yeah, terms I mean. Of- yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with you. And yeah. um, it, it's, it's it, yeah. sort of, uh, man, I, I keep up, I walk my dogs when I'm, I don't walk with friends. Yeah. I don't go for coffee. I go to the golf. I don't play, I play, I don't watch rugby. All the things that I use mm. to keep me well. Yeah. When I'm not well, mm. I just stop doing them. Yeah. Yeah. And that that is the thought process where what's the point in doing that because I'm never going to get well again. Mm, that's yeah. my depressive thought. Yeah, yeah. That's who I am, and no matter how hard I've tried all my life, mm. I give up when I go back to the complete basics of getting up, eating, yeah. walking my dogs, and that mm. is about I'm all I do is function. Yeah, yeah. Whereas as I climb out, as I climb out of it, it's a it's a nice honeymoon period where you come out, you're feeling better, you can, you know, and I do it. I have a big exercise routine. I do a lot of swimming, and mm-hmm. I do a lot of walking, and yeah. then you you've got to look forward. There's no point looking backwards, and and you know, God, I have a bad depressive. You just gotta park it, Susan. Yeah. Park yeah. it. You have to move on. Mm. Um, I know yeah. for a fact, friends of mine and myself, that your manic periods, getting back into a normal routine is much harder after a manic group. Mm. Mm-hmm. Because you can cause you can cause a lot of damage with high to mm. friends and family. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said earlier, I'm very lucky I don't have them anymore. Mm. Sure. Yeah, and I guess there's something maybe that that's kind of come up in our conversations before today, even kind of have that self compassion part as well. So kind of, you know, sort of kind of allowing that. So for for what happens when when people are in extreme states and sort of kind of not yeah. giving yourself too hard of a time for that, as you said, kind of parking it and moving forward all the time and always kind of that understanding of of yourself and um, Sophie if I come back to you in terms of I suppose, what Steve kind of was saying there's a lot in that I don't know what what if any of that resonates with your experience yeah yeah definitely um definitely does in terms of like the self-isolating and things like that I I definitely do that I really start to kind of shut out friends and you know I think that um, you kind of mentioned it, the kind of thoughts that like, I think we can kind of really glam onto when we're down. Um, there's a real kind of specific narrative in my head that just seems to take over, which is that I am a burden and my children deserve better. And that those thoughts can just circle like all day every day uh you know when I'm kind of like in the hole and like I can they those thoughts can start to feel really convincing you know mm. um especially when yeah especially when you literally can't bring yourself 
to do the most basic things like Steve was describing, like the things mm -hmm. that we do when we're well to stay mm -hmm. well. And the things that we enjoy, like, because that's the thing with bipolar, like, you know, you, you can have really, you know, fulfilling, me meaningful life and like, you know, have really good periods of wellness. Mm -hmm. But it's just I, exactly what Stephen said there really, really touched on something for me was like, every time I go low, I just, it's like, it's like I'm back at the very beginning again and I think I have this constant refrain of I'll never be free of this and I have to work really hard to counter those thoughts and be like no you've actually always gotten free of this again you've always weathered it you've always survived it and even though there's a thought in my head of this is the time I won't come back this is the mm -hmm. time I won't be able to make it back I just have to try and you know I, I write things down for myself and um, it's kind of accountability and it's kind of a helpful thing to revisit uh mm -hmm. when I'm unwell but funny enough when you guys were talking about whatsapp I have a whatsapp group with myself that's mm -hmm. just like a place where I kind of can chart how I'm feeling or how my mind is on a certain day and it's very good for when I'm going to the psychiatrist to chat through how I've been the last mm -hmm. kind of few weeks I'll always I have a total irrational urge to be top of the class and pretend I've been totally fine mm. and that everything's grand mm. and which is insane because it's the exact place that I'm supposed to not pretend mm -hmm. um, but I find if I take out my phone and look at the whatsapp group that I have with myself that I literally call weirds because mm. it's where I chart how weird my head is being on any given day and mm. I'll look back and see you know that I haven't been good, that I've been doing, you know, a lot of like ruminating at three in the morning and yeah. a lot of paranoia or stuff like that. And I'll be able yeah. to, it forces me to be honest. And in, then similarly, you know, if I'm in like a really bad place and I write myself messages there, mm. it kind of spurs a bit of self-compassion, Yeah, you know, it's, and I yeah. guess it's like as well, I can, come back to it on another day that I've written myself a message and been like you're doing okay today mm. you're not a burden and you know you're just yeah. you're just managing as best you can with an illness that mm. is hard and yeah. it's an illness that is kind of a liar like that's the problem yeah. with mental illness like I always say it to my friend who suffers with anxiety and I'm always like anxiety is a liar it is a lying bitch don't listen to anxiety mm. because it will latch on to your worst catastrophic fear that is not rooted in reality you know yeah so I think that like you said trying to reach out to other people and see how they are like is really healing it's like mm. I, I do AA because mm -hmm. I'm uh, an alcoholic as well which mm. is apparently really common for people with bipolar because mm. you try to self-medicate and calm yeah. your brain down with booze but in AA a lot of that uh, is about kind of community and helping each other a lot and like I do think that it's one way to turn your mind away from all of the you're a bird yeah. you're you're useless you know you're a bad yeah. person and stuff is to just reach out and ask someone else how they are today yeah yeah absolutely and I guess and and certainly there's a couple of things maybe just to even to, to say about that it's really helpful in terms of as you say even the whatsapp group allows you maybe to it sounds like to relate to yourself a little bit differently so we'd never talk to our friends the way we might talk to ourselves you know so we'd never talk to another person so as you said it kind of it opens up that possibility for for self-compassion maybe mm. um and and maybe as, as sort of steve is saying as well that kind of knowing yourself too and knowing kind of the stuff that helps knowing what what doesn't help um and i'm aware we're we're sort of running out of time now so um i don't know if I was just maybe going to, if even very briefly, so just we've only maybe got a minute or two, but maybe Steve, if I if I start with you and then I'll go to Sophie, what what advice or what you might want someone to know, maybe who's kind of recently struggling or even you in the in your early 20s, what you'd kind of want to tell them, you know, I don't know. If that's yeah. yeah, I think uh, the big thing is that your bipolar can change. Mm. And you know, a rut, and in a, a, you know, you're having a lot of mania, you're having big depressions. I, I, when I was newly married and had six and a half years, 
uh, without any uh, or depression. I was clear, and I'd actually said that I wasn't going to get it again. Mm. I mean, to have six and a half years middle uh, well, um, and then a while later it's so ill. It's just it never just stops and changes. What it means is that you've got to believe that it will change for the better mm, mm. and just got to hang on to that that's yeah. all that's yeah. the only advice really is yeah you know you're never going to be in the same cycle mm. at the moment you yeah. know you you, you, you you know you make friends that's that's my advice and, and, and you know Thank you. Yeah. that's it yeah, thank you, Steve. That that's a really helpful actually and very helpful note to, to end on. Thank you. And and Sophie? Yeah, I like to hear that, Steve. Thank yeah. you for saying that. It's really positive. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I suppose the one thing that I guess I'd say is um that like really you won't find a person in the world who hasn't been touched in some way by mental illness. And yeah. I just honestly find that through my work, I've learned, and I, that's, this is what I would tell my 22 year old though, is that like we have way more co in common than we have differences. And when you open up to somebody about something like this, it is 99 times out of a hundred reciprocated. People yeah. really understand. And yeah. it's, you know, I, and like, it's just so um, important to, to share um so that we all can feel less alone because obviously mental illness and the shame that goes along with it mm -hmm. thrives um thrives in the silence yeah. and just don't want that you know I just want everyone to just feel empowered to mm -hmm. be like I am I have this mental illness but you know don't write me off because mm -hmm. if you write me off you're writing you probably most people off because yeah. people have experiences like this all the time every day and it's hard but it's you know normal yeah yeah thank you yeah that's really really well put and and and, and thank you both actually for a really kind of thought-provoking conversation today and certainly as you said kind of naming it and, and talking about it it's it's really helpful to have these conversations and, and continue sort of having them um, so yeah, so maybe wrapping up. Thank you so much, Sophie. Thank you so much, Steve. You've been very patient with the tech issues. So really, really grateful for your for your time today. Thank you. And thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon um, and for all the questions that you put in. Again, apologies um, if we didn't get to your specific one. Um, so just before I wrap up, maybe two last things to, to tell you about. So the Aware, Aware is Living Well with Bipolar program, which Steve mentioned there earlier, is an eight-week program for people living with bipolar. It's free. Uh, it can be online or in person. Or I think they start on the 27th of March to register. So really, really recommend you have a look on our website to, to check them out. Place where I suppose where people can learn more about the condition, uh, connect with people with maybe similar experiences and, and kind of think about ways of living well. We also run a relatives and friends group and um, to for people who are supporting a loved one in that and then the second last thing is moving on to our webinar for next week or next month rather so that is on the gut brain access and how diet can be used in association with conventional therapies to improve outcomes so that's dr ted deneen professor of psychiatry and myself and um, certainly that will hopefully be a very fascinating conversation and a specialist interest of mine so yeah, maybe we'll leave it there. So thank you all so much again. Thanks everyone for joining and we will hopefully see you next month. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye now.